You know, people from Moncton take great pride in its people, its businesses, <coughs> Casino Moncton, and of course, its international airport, which has served uh, North America for years. But did you know one of the biggest publicity for the Moncton airport was on Twilight Zone in the 1960s? So today we're going to be talking about the very important episode, one of the best of all time, Season 2, The Odyssey of Flight 33. Now, this was the 54th episode of Twilight Zone, the second season, and it was the 18th in that campaign. Now, uh, an unlikely break of the time barrier finds a commercial airliner sent back into prehistoric age and in New York City of 1939. The tale is a modern telling of the Flying Dutchman myth and was written by series creator Rod Serling. It originally aired on February 24, 1961. Now, the great John Anderson played uh, Skipper Farver, the captain. A great uh, character cast, of course, Paul Comey, Sandy uh, Kenyon, Harp McGuire, Beverly Brown, uh, Wayne Heffley, Betty Gardy, Jay Overholtz, Nancy uh, Rennick, Lester Fletcher, and Robin McCord. The supporting characters really uh, may, uh, make it. Now, according to Searling's narration, you're ra riding on a jet airliner en route from London, New York. You're at 35,000 feet atop an overcast and roughly 55 minutes uh, from Idlewild Airport. But what you've seen occur inside the cockpit of this plane is no reflection on the aircraft or the crew. It's a safe, well-engineered, perfectly designed machine. And the men you just met are a trained, cool, highly efficient team. The problem is simply that a plane is going too fast and there's nothing within the realm of knowledge uh, or at least logic to explain it. Unbeknownst to passenger and crew, this airplane is heading into an iron charter region well off the beaten track of commercial travelers. It's moving into the Twilight Zone, what you're about to see we call the Odyssey of Flight 33. Now, the captain, Captain uh, Farver, he notices a, a change after getting, you know, normal readings, a change in the speed of the aircraft. Now, Global Airlines Flight 33, uh, the plane in question, is on route from London to New York City. About 50 mile, miles from Idlewild Airport, uh, <coughs> and after connecting with Gander, Newfoundland, you know, uh, the great airport uh, in uh, that province, Captain Farbany's crew notes that the ground speed of their Boeing 707 is rapidly increasing beyond all uh, reason. Their true airspeed remains constant, so there's door near, no risk of the plane breaking up, but the, the ground speed is accelerating like crazy. But he can no longer contact anyone by radio. And here's how it happens. When he go past Gander, he says, let's try to raise Moncton or Boston. And Moncton's not responding, and neither is Boston. So it's quite interesting to mention three of the nicest East Coast airports, and Rod Serling's brother being a, you know, a flight person, we'll get into that in a second, I think he maybe motivated uh, Rod to use those, uh, what do you call, uh, po points of interest, or points of, on the map for, for uh, airline traffic to be in the episode. Now, when the plane travels through a flash of light and severe turbulence, the captain wonders if they've gone through the sound barrier. There's no apparent damage to the aircraft. Still unable to connect any uh, contact anyone on the ground, including Moncton, and at the risk of potential collision with another aircraft, Farver finally decides to descend below the clouds. The crew is able to identify the coastline of Manhattan Island and other geographic landmarks, but there is no city. The crew realizes they have traveled far back in time when, get this, the sea grazing dinosaurs. And they're very expensive, we'll get that in a second. Their only hope of returning to the present day is to increase altitude and speed and attempt to catch the same jet stream. After another flash of light and violent shaking, New York City is once again visible, and although they still cannot uh, contact Idlewild, they are able to reach LaGuardia Airport. However, the air traffic controller on the radio does not understand their technical, technical references, including radar and jet aircraft. The controller eventually clears the aircraft to land in LaGuardia, but orders the captain to report to the CAA office afterwards. The captain remarks that they haven't called the Federal Aviation Administration by that name in several years. The co-pilot spots the buildings <coughs> and uh, structures from the New York World's Fair of 1939 below. The captain eventually attempts one more ascent before the fuel runs out in an effort to return the plane to 1961. He addresses the passengers, explaining that they have traveled back in time. All I ask of you is that you remain calm, he tells the pastors over the PA system, and pray. 
Now, uh, Narod's closing narration. A global jet airliner en route from London, New York on an uneventful afternoon in the year 1961, but now reported overdue and missing, and by now searched for on land, sea, and air by anguished human beings, fearful of what they'll find. But you and I know where she is. You and I know what's happened. So if some moment, any moment, you hear the sound of jet engines flying atop the overcast, engines that sound searching and lost, engines that sound desperate, shoot up a flare or do something. This would be Global 33 trying to get home from the Twilight Zone. Now, the script for this runs so fast, you could make probably a two-hour movie. It seems very compressed, but it's very, very, it's a very high-quality episode, probably one of my favorites, because just a bunch of normal people on a flight, you know, doing the readings and the connections, and this happens. And like with the Bermuda Triangle uh, lessons, the disappearing aircraft, every time you get in the plane, the camaraderie of the, uh, the air traffic, uh, you know, the pilots and the, the stewardesses is well reflected here and well put together. Now, Sierling originally developed the idea for the show when he learned that American Airlines had a mock-up of a 707 interior previously used for flight attendant training that he could move, make available to TV or film production companies. Sierling's brother, aviation writer Robert J. Sierling, uh, a very, very interesting cat, by the way, helped his brother with the cockpit dialogue for the show by discussing the show's premise with a Transworld Airlines captain. And after the show aired, several pilots later wrote to say that he thought the cockpit dialogue was among the most authentic ever in a TV show. Uh, it does stand up some, as was shown on City TV this week, it does stand up, uh, you know, some more than 60 years later. Now, the Brontosaurus model, which costs, I think, special effects for CBS tens of... Uh, tens of thousands of dollars on modern uh, money and the miniature jungle was uh, set from the 1960 uh, film dinosaurs were used for the stop motion animation but he still had to pay for it it was quite costly now LaGuardia airport although it was had open in October 39 and thus was open during the second half of the 3940 World's Fair held in New York City was not officially named after Mary, uh, Mayor uh, Fiolo H. LaGuardia until 47 up to that point and its official name was the New York Municipal Airport. However, the nickname LaGuardia Field was a common use two weeks after the airport opened. Now, the episode was one of several Twilight Zone stories adapted as a graphic novel. The adaptation expands upon the television episode, including a subplot involving silver passengers and flight crew, as well as updated the story in 1973. It also adds a time jump to the future. Now, I don't know why they put Gander and Moncton and Boston in the spin but because this was the what they call the the ground points for a lot of flights, I think that's well put together because emergency landings have been held in Gander. We know what happened 9/11 when the planes were brought down. They all went to Gander. Uh, Moncton has always been uh, a backup. Boston as well. But it's interesting. I don't know any other reference to New Brunswick uh, on a TV show like that, like a thriller show, before or after. If you can tell me. If Moncton has ever been featured in science fiction on TV since then, I don't I think it. Maybe it's uh, it created some publicity for the airport. But when you hear uh, Anderson say Moncton, he pronounces it correctly because of Moncton or whatever like that. But as well, like I said, it's well put together. It's a fat, it's a fast episode, and I'm very proud to say that I work for the Moncton Times newspaper. So knowing that Moncton is referred to uh, in a Twilight Zone episode makes me very proud. So. My, the paper I work for has a connection with Twilight Zone. So ladies and gentlemen, if you like what you're doing with our Twilight Zone uh, episode recaps, let us know with a like, comment, subscribe, or share. Merry Christmas and Happy Hanukkah. Bye.